Hey guys, welcome to the LT Brings the Heat podcast. We're your hosts, Sean Laird and Adam Heisler, where we talk about baseball and sports performance. With topics ranging from coaching, business, and player development, our goal is to bring you a no BS approach to development in baseball and sports performance. Hope you guys enjoy. Let's rock and roll. Hey guys, we've got a great episode today. Uh, we're going to talk about a uh, current event situation uh, with Fernando Tatis. Adam does a phenomenal job of breaking down some things and talking about some things because we, we maybe as soon as I found out, I texted Adam because I wanted to talk about it. Um, and this is an episode, um, you know, one of my uh, client's dads actually asked some questions about street deconditioning. Uh, awesome guy and, and their, their family's like family to me. And, and he made some great questions that we kind of jump in for, you know, the strength training aspect of things, you know, the importance of it, what, how it helps players, how it helps guys, um, as well as the nutrition part of things. Um, so we're really excited about this episode for you guys. And Adam, is there anything else on here that really jumps out at you that's important for guys to hear? Yeah, guys, this is kind of the extra stuff that isn't just the meat and potatoes. So definitely dive in. Sean does a great job of explaining nutrition as well as strength and conditioning kind of the myths behind the whole strength and conditioning side as well as how much this is going to help us perform on the field and keep us on the field because that's the biggest thing is the best ability is availability so we'll cover that standpoint we also like john was saying we hit on the tatis junior standpoint pretty hard so (laughs) this is a fun fun episode i think everybody's really going to enjoy this one Absolutely. And, and one thing to add on at the end is Adam, you know, everybody's growth and everybody's road is different. We talk about it all the time. And Adam talks about him being a kind of maturing later and becoming the six, five, sixty guy and how important the weight room was for him. So th- there are certain people that are always going to be those physical specimens, but there's going to be guys like Adam that, you know, you, you want to be like those guys where you're constantly working, constantly working. And all of a sudden one day it's like, wow, this, this is amazing. This how how important being dedicated and doing the work helps. So Um, We really are excited for you guys to listen to this episode. And as always, leave us that five-star review if you guys enjoy it. Um, So here we roll. Hey, guys. Welcome to another episode of LT Brings the Heat. We're your hosts, Sean Lair and Adam Heisler. Um, we got a couple of topics today. It's mainly we're going to talk about strength and conditioning, kind of like the what, when, whys of strength and conditioning. Um, But also, we're going to kind of talk about a little current events uh, and the whole Fernando Tatis Jr. situation. I'll go ahead. Adam, why don't you kick it off and kind of give us your opinion. Obviously, there's probably people that are listening that haven't really heard much about it. Uh, I would say most of the baseball world has, but kind of break it down for us a little bit. Yeah, so I woke up, I guess, yesterday morning and Twitter world was going crazy about this Fernando Tatis Jr. swinging at this 3-0 pitch, hitting a grand slam in the eighth inning when the team is up by seven runs. Now, when I'm looking at it, I see absolutely nothing wrong with this. So when the manager of the Texas Rangers comes out saying that this is the unwritten rules of baseball, this is BS, and then they throw with the next batter, I was floored by it. I couldn't believe that this is going on in this day and age of baseball. And I was telling a buddy of mine, honestly, this is why young kids aren't watching the game of baseball anymore because you're not allowed to have fun. There's yep. so many of these unwritten rules. This is why kids are watching other kids play video games on TV versus mm-hmm. watching actual baseball games. So from that situation, we've both played the game. Now, these are guys at the major league level. They're up by seven runs. There's been games before where guys will score seven to eight runs in one inning. So nothing is safe. Yep. Yep. This year is different where there's only 60 games. There's not 162. You don't know that chance of making the playoffs versus not. Like Every game counts. That's what they're promoting. Every game matters. Every game matters. Well, if every game matters, you never take your foot off the gas. And from a hitting standpoint, the bases are loaded. What do guys get paid to do? Knock in runs, hit home runs, batting average, all the stuff, the OPS, everything there. And you're telling this young 21-year-old who right now may be the second or third best player in the game behind Mike Trout to yep. take a pitch because it's the unwritten rule of baseball. I was absolutely just astonished. I couldn't believe that this was going on and this was a debate and I was – Very upset with the Texas Rangers organization, the way they're leading. But also I was super upset with the Padres manager didn't have Tatis Jr.'s back, basically saying that he gave him a take sign and he's got to know better than this. And Mm -hmm. he's young, he's immature right now. Where in that locker room right now, I'm going to be kind of uneasy with my manager for not having my back in that situation. And, hey, this is professional baseball. This isn't youth baseball. It's not travel baseball that we coach. We know when to kind of shut down the running game when the score gets out of hand or when to do things different. This is major league baseball at the highest level. And if the pitcher had a problem with it, then don't get behind three and zero to hitter. And my whole thing was, I don't think the pitcher had a problem with it from watching his reaction. He just, Hey, I gave up a bomb, but it was when the manager, the leader showed that this isn't right. And then it starts to rile up their dugout. Like, Oh, well that's not right. 
these unwritten rules are unwritten because they're stupid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like if they were actual rules, they would be written down for everybody to see. And yep. so it's just another thing that the baseball world, we got a problem with of this is the most exciting player in the game that had two home runs at night, seven RBIs. And instead of talking about that, we're talking about him swinging at a three Oh pitch and hitting a grand slam. Yep. One last thing. And then I'll kind of get to you on it is, yeah, all right. So say he swings at that three Oh pitch and hits into a ground ball, double play. Nobody's talking about the situation. The manager's not mad. Nobody's going to bring this up, but just because he got his feelings hurt that his team got almost taken advantage of or take behind the woodshed beat a couple of times. This is why we're talking about it in this situation. So with us playing the game, man, I was just wanted to open up with this because it's such a hot topic going on right now. And I am glad to see that not it's the outside sports world starting to get in like, why is baseball acting like this? Like, it is the pitcher's fault. It is the other team's fault. And it's that old saying the Miami Hurricanes used to have in football is, if you don't want us to score, stop us. Like, we're going to keep going. It's not in our jobs that we have to back off the pedal. Because we both know when you play this game and you back off that pedal, the game will catch you by. And mm-hmm. the last thing was somebody put up when – if Tatis takes that pitch and then two years later when he's in arbitration trying to get his, his money's worth – they're going to tell him that, hey, if you would have hit more home runs or drove in more, we would have gave you more money. That's what he's ultimately doing. This is his job. His job is to go out there and play hard and compete and not back off the pedal. But that's kind of my rant on this whole thing. I can't wait to hear yours because you're a little bit more excited about this stuff than I am. So <laughs> if I'm getting excited about it, I know you're about to drop some bombs on us. Absolutely. You know, I, to me, it's an absolute joke. Like for us to sit there as baseball guys to get on Twitter and like that's that's the topic of the day, it's an absolute joke. Like what we should be doing is we should be – sitting here and enjoying the game, talking about the, I man, damn, look at how good this Stanford Fernando Tatis Jr. guys is, man. Look how good this, how good the young talents in MLB right now. This should be awesome. That like, those are things we should be talking about, but you know, let's, let's flip the roles. Like say a pitcher's throwing, you know, they're up seven runs. He's throwing a no hitter in the eighth inning. The guy's down 0 two. He's not going to groove him a fastball down the middle. Cause he feels yep. bad for him. He's going to still be trying to get the guy out. And that's the thing is like, we're taught as young ball players. Hey, we're supposed to compete every pitch, every play, every game football. They talk about it being a game of inches. You don't take pitches off. And th- this, it just absolutely blows my mind that we're in a situation and, and it's it, to me, it's like kind of a carryover what the world is like nowadays. Like you, you, you have to, everybody's sensitive to everybody's feelings. You can't state facts because pe- it hurts people's feelings. Like facts are ignored. It's all about the narrative. And for me, like I, if, if I would have been him, obviously I'm a lot more stubborn guy than his. I would not have re- I've apologized. Apologize. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would have done the Conor McGregor thing. And I, I have to like, <laughs> apologize. Absolutely. Nobody. That's right. Because, and that's the thing, you're 100% right, though. Like, those guys, and obviously I never played in the show, um, but we obviously played at a high level. And, and when I sit there and I have my head coach, my manager, who's not backing me up in that situation, said, hey, you know, this guy's he's young, he's fire, and he wants to compete. That's what I would have said. I'm like, yep. hey, I have no problem with him swinging at that. Now, I get if it was 15 to nothing, and, you know, it, like, I understand, like, not stealing or not going on certain pass balls, but at the same time, we got to also respect the game. We mm-hmm. got to respect the situation. We got to, we got to, like, that guy went down 3 0. That dude deserves to get a hammer, like, to, to, to get a guy ahead to drop a bomb off of him. Like, I, I, I would have loved to have been 0 2 in situations like, oh my God, here comes my, my free fastball because I'm 0 2. It's late in the game. We're getting hammered. Like, I can go meet, like, we played Louisiana Lafayette and we were down 11 to nothing in the bottom of the eighth inning. I specifically remember this game. We scored 12 runs in the bottom of the eighth yep. inning and mm-hmm. ended up winning that game. I've seen so like a couple years ago, this guy from East Cobb, we were playing, it was seven to nothing. We were up seven, nothing against East Cobb. It's eight run rule. And we have another get another, another game right behind us. We're in Nashville playing a music city classic and it's getaway day. It's a hundred degrees. Let's get the hell out of here. We're going to run rule these guys. Right? So we steal from first to second and this old school, not, it's not a coincidence. The guy's old school mm-hmm. is bitching and complaining like, Oh my God, here, look, like, what are we doing? You're stealing with a seven lead. I'm first of all, it's metal bats. It's high school baseball. Like you can sneeze in the score. The guys, the team score six runs. That kind of mentality, like to me has got to change again. Like if it's 15, nothing, I can understand like, Hey, let's take Tati out. We're going to put some guys on, on the bench onto the game, let them swing away. But again, at the same time, like, if it, if it is a guy on the bench who's 3-0, and he's got seven ABs on the, on the year. He's trying to prove himself. Maybe he's another young guy. You think that guy's going to take 3-0? Hell no, right? Like, like, we need him to get after it too. And that's, to me, and man, I just, I can't stand the whole sensitivity to, to everyone's feelings and stuff like that. Like, that's, whatever they say, if it's an unwritten rule or not, like, I've never heard of that. Like, I, it's, it, to me, it's, it's stupid. Like, I, we've talked about before, like, the unwritten rules of, like, hey, 
you know, let's not beat up teams too bad in certain situations, but that is seven to nothing. And in an MLB game where, you know, one guy can score four runs on one swing real easy. That's stupid. That just blows my mind. That and hitting is the hardest thing to do in all the sports. And we're telling the guy to take a pitch to get in the worst count mm-hmm. and then say, we've all been there before where we take the three Oh cookie. The next one's a three, one paint. And then all of a sudden you're back to three, two in a battle. Yep. And yep. so you're just taking everything right out of him. And the last thing we'll touch on before we get on is, Everybody wants to talk about a 3-0 count. As I didn't realize that it was an unwritten rule that you don't swing 3-0. So you just look at the numbers continuously. If you have your good power hitters up that you trust, you're going to let them swing 3-0. There's no better time to swing the bat. And I promise you, if you let them do that over a course of the season, they're going to get a lot more success than they are going to have that failure. And so that's one thing I would like to promote to guys is – as it gets to that reaching that level of, let's say, 16 and on up, start to learn yourself. If you're a top hitter, when you're 3-0, don't make it easy on that guy. If he grooves one in there, do exactly what Ferdinand Tatis Jr. did. Hit you a bomb and run around the bases knowing, yep. hey, I just got a cookie because the guy fell behind. Make him pay for falling behind. Don't give him a freebie of letting back into it. And the same goes with umpires that give the guys freebies too. Is 3-0 is not automatic because you'll change a hole at bat and inning a game because of you calling a 3-0 pitch just because it's 3-0. Yep. Yep. And I, I do the same thing with our Bulls guys and at the high school mm-hmm. age level, like um, I, we kind of have a rule. If nobody's on base, we need base runners. We're not swinging 3-0. But if we have base runners, specifically guys in scoring position, um, whether it's my, you know, big, you know, three, four hole hitter, the guy I could drive into gaps, or maybe it's my eight hole hitter might be struggling a little bit. Hell, I'm probably going to give him a green light 3-0 and I'm going to be like, hey, make sure this is perfect. This has got to be grooved in there. It's got to be the right spot. Um, mm-hmm. you know, cause we're teaching that at the youngest age levels. Nobody has a problem with that. Nobody's ever had a problem with that. And all of a sudden at the highest level where it's the hardest game in the world and they, like sw- literally hitting, they all, like sports science guys, they always talk about like, that's the hardest thing to do in all sports, but yet we're supposed to take the, the, you know, put our pump the brakes at times. Like that doesn't make any sense, but exactly. All right, Sean, let's transition over to, we got a question about a strength and conditioning question. So their main thing they were wondering is, All right, so if you have to pick one or the other from maybe a baseball lesson type of skill, whether it's hitting, pitching, or fielding versus strength and conditioning, how how do you go about choosing that? And then also kind of what is a great age to start introducing them to the strength and conditioning side? Yeah, so I love answering this question. I talk about all the time. So first, I'm going to talk about the myth busters, people thinking that kids lifting weights at a young age stunts their growth. And there's, you know, to me, it's 2020 and it just blows my mind that people still think like that. And it's mainly moms. A lot of times, no offense to mothers. They just, they just want to do what's best for the kids, but it's does not stunt your growth lifting at a young age. Like I specifically started when I was 13, I believe I'm six, three, two forty. So <laughs> I'm, I'm fine. Like I'm not, I didn't stop my growth when I started at a young age. But what I like to say is like, you know, specifically, I would say 12 to 13 is a good year. Like I have a couple of guys that are 12 right now. One of the guys, 11, another guy's 12. That's in my program right now. And you know, the confidence that it builds in the weight room, like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about it all the time. Like everything you need to, to learn in life, you can learn in the weight room through the adversity, through the struggles, through, you know, conquering certain things that are setbacks, all that stuff. And it's, it's an absolute truth. And, you know, there's a reason why football coaches stress the importance of strength and conditioning and that's three to condition coach because that literally makes or breaks their program. And, and to me, it's like the best age to start is right around that 12 to 13 old age range, sometimes 13 if they're a little behind. Now, you can honestly change that. And what I consider strength and conditioning um, for young kids, like you can even start at as low as six, seven years old. And people are like, what, six, seven years old? And this is what I mean by six, uh, six seven year old strength and conditioning running, jumping, climbing, pull ups all that stuff. Like back in the day, I remember us doing chin holds in the weight room, sit up tests when we were in second or third grade, I can remember doing that. Nowadays it's a little bit changed, but you know, to me, like I'm going to get my four-year-old daughter into jujitsu here this, this, this fall. Um, And that's a form of strength and conditioning, you know, wrestling around that, that strength um, that it's going to take, take to do that. There's so many aspects of things. So I would say the early age levels, like get them as active as possible. You know, playgrounds are obviously important for that two, three, four year age range but play multiple sports, you know, wrestling, baseball, basketball, football, there's different strength and skills that are coordinated with that. Um, but sprinting again, like if people overlook that strengthen is a part of sprinting is a part of that strength and conditioning. Um, but if you want to get into like, Hey, let's we're, we're 12, 13 years old and we need to figure out what we're going to do. Um, it depends on the client. It depends on the kid. So, um, if the kid is, is got some skills at the plate and he can hit or he could throw and he's doing really well, you know, we, 
kind of transitioned him to like, Hey, like we need to start doing this strength and conditioning thing. We're going to help you out a little bit. Maybe he's weak at certain areas and we need to get stronger. Uh, and on the flip side of that, um, maybe he needs to fine tune some things, you know, lessons wise. But the main thing is, is if your kid is 12, 13 year old, 12, 13 years old, they're in middle school essentially. And they're physically behind. Like they're not as fast as other guys. They're not as strong as other guys. You see them kind of run and they're kind of uncoordinated. Now they're in motor skills. They're, st they're still trying to learn their motor skills and they, they don't really have the hand-eye coordination. That's a big red flag. It's like, hey, we need, we need to kind of get this kid, you know, to fire correctly. We need to get this kid to kind of feel and have more proprioception with his body. And to me, that 12 to 13 year old age range is such a big time to kind of start them in that process. And what I mean by that is we train... We train movements at Larry's training. A lot of strength and conditioning guys will train movements. Like I'm not talking about getting a 12 year old kid or a 13 year old kid underneath a barbell and squatting. We're learning, you know, basic squat, basic hinge, basic lunge, picking things up, putting things down. There's real world things that we could do. Like kids carrying their their heavy backpacks all the time. Like farmers walks is something that people do naturally in their lives, picking kids up. You know, that's something that we really utilize in our training is carrying, throwing, running, sprinting, you know, jumping, all that stuff. So for me, that 12 to 13 age range is the big part, especially when it comes to like, hey, if, if I want to make a difference in my son's, you know, basketball, baseball, football, whatever sport it is, I always say like, you have to treat strength and conditioning as its own sport. Um, and the way I kind of correlate it at Laird's training is a lot of young guys that are transitioning into strength they will probably do some speed camps, speed and strength camps at first, where they're learning some strength work, some, some stability work and some running work. And then as they get older and they transition to that middle school years, we transition them to, Hey, like now we need to do this monthly instead of like eight to 10 weeks out of the year, we're getting strength and conditioning. We're learning the movements because it's going to help them on the field in the long run for sure. No, that's a great, I mean, a great answer. I think you just covered the whole basics from the side of things. Uh, one thing I'll add in there towards, cause I think you hit the nail on the head from that situation is once or your daughter reaches that where they have elite, not elite or really good swing mechanics for their age. Now it literally just comes down to power. Like what do they have in their body putting out of there? So there's so many times where we'll get a kid to a situation of, all right, we think his swing's pretty locked in. And now it's, we send you on over to the weight room. And like you said, treat it as it's his own sport. And I think a lot of people look at it as the weight room is, Oh, you're going to bench squat clean at whether you're 10 years old or you're 20 years old. And that's to definitely not the case whether it's going to be, we're going to do bear crawls. We're going to run up hill sprints. We're going to push a sled with no weight on it. There's just so many different aspects and variables that you can add into training that are going to help them. And like you said, they don't realize, but when they're carrying these book bags and we see how heavy some of these book bags are, they're training their body right now doing that kind of stuff. So they're already doing this. It's just the whole method of they hear weight training or strength and conditioning. It kind of scares them off because they do believe the stunt and the growth and the whole stuff there. So I'm glad that you were able to kind of, hammer that question there because I think you did an awesome job of letting everybody know the bigger picture out there of what this actually is going into it and it's not just you seeing how much weight you can put on your back and try to squat it yep for sure absolutely you know from your aspect of things Adam you were always the quick twitch guy you like I believe you were a 6560 guy in college is that right that's correct so with your aspect of things and as you were growing up when did you kind of like hey you know, like street the conditioning is kind of important for me and kind of, kind of, I know you were a Juco guy first, then you obviously went to South, like kind of break us down your history of that to kind of get guys to kind of understand like how important street the conditioning is, but also kind of the avenue and the route you took to, to become the guy you are today. Well, it's funny. Cause I get asked that a lot of like, how did you, at 12 years old, were you always the fastest kid on the team? And I literally was a average to above average runner. And it wasn't until I was 16 years old. I'll never forget. I grew a little bit. So legs got longer. And then I just started to get into the weight room. And I was at 16 years old because even back then, even though it wasn't, it doesn't seem that long ago. And even though yeah. it was, was, Hey, stay light. Cause you're going to move faster. Mm -hmm. And so I bought into that myth of, Hey, I'm going to be 165 pounds because if I do heavier squats and get bigger or bulkier, I'm going to actually slow down. We're looking back now. I'm like, that was the worst idea that anybody could have ever told me when you watch Mike Trout who's six three two forty, and he absolutely flies on the bases. And then you start to think about football players and the same exact thing. And that whole myth of baseball players need to be long and lean. Well, you go watch the New York Yankees lineup and you watch judge Luke Voigt, Voigt you watch Stanton, you watch these guys. You're like, that's not long and lean. And they're playing at the <laughs> highest level of baseball. So mm -hmm. there's ways to get around this, but I didn't really notice that speed gain until I got introduced to squats until I got mm -hmm. introduced to sled drags, sled pushes. And I always go back to this. My favorite one is, hill sprints i ran hill sprints nonstop in junior college and I, that's where i think 
ultimately helped me reach my fastest 60 time. And it's funny because I ran a faster 60 when I was 195 pounds than when I was 165 pounds. Oh, yeah. And so that whole myth behind the method of you got to stay light was just knocked it out of the ballpark. And so it was so cool to see. But I was a late bloomer in the weight room. It wasn't big and popular coming up. I, like I said, it was 15, 16 year old year. We had just introduced it at the school I was at as well as I was starting to do stuff on my own, like the wrist rolls, the Bryce bucket, these little things there. And then slowly but surely started to transition into some Olympic lifts, some mm -hmm. squats. And then, like I said, more than anything is the sled drag the sled pushes uh the parachutes to help with the longer distance but it was just so crazy to see and like when i tell kids this is i literally was an average to above average runner and then my 16 year old year i go to my first showcase and i popped a six six in high school and everybody's like where the heck did that come from and it was literally just from growing because i was a late bloomer growing wise as well as introducing myself into the weight room and so guys that want to wait and pay for individual lessons type of stuff once you've kind of mastered those or feel like you've reached your peak in it now you have to get your butt over to strength and conditioning side. So with you, I know you mentioned you had done stuff when you were earlier on in your life and you're also in the boxing background too. When did you first kind of start getting into strength and conditioning overall? Yeah. So like I, the actual weight room, weight room was when I was like 13, I believe uh, is, is what I said earlier, somewhere right around there. It's like that 13 to four, like 13 transition to 14 year old year. And but when I was younger, I like, I was really lucky in the fact that my dad was like, Hey, you know, we're going to like, he kind of grew us up with the mentality of like, Hey, like we play sports, we do activities. Like we're not sitting around watching TV all the time. Like it's part of normal life. So like I was boxing, I was running track, I was doing baseball, I was doing basketball, I was doing football, I was doing all these things growing up and it was just part of the norm. And so a lot of push ups, pull ups and stuff like that was a part of our routine. We do med ball rotational stuff, like old school boxing type stuff, like the old, you know, the old Mike Tyson training with rotating side to side with med balls with a partner. We would do all that stuff all the time. And, and for me, like I can remember being in middle school and repping out pull ups and thinking it was no big deal, um, which a lot of guys can do obviously, but it was like that relative strength, which is your body weight strength, um, relative to your weight, obviously, and, and how strong you are to be able to do, you know, body weight stuff like pull-ups and push-ups and stuff it was always really good so because I could control my body and I was fast and I was always a fast guy but I wasn't like the fastest guy mm -hmm. um and I will say like I ran track and it was right before when I was in seventh grade I was probably like the fourth or fifth fastest kid at the city track meet at, in Kokomo which those who don't know Kokomo is like 60,000 to 80,000 people in Kokomo and so I was athletic I was quick uh and then I went through a whole year of um weight training. And I started doing squats. I started doing lunges and I went from being like the fourth or fifth fastest guy to the fastest guy. And I'm like, Oh my God, like, is this what steroids is like? <laughs> so I was like, this is amazing. And, and, and just, I like for me, and I'll, I'll kind of say this and I'm not trying to brag about myself because it, we're just using our experience when we're explaining these things. But like, um, I had a mentality that like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Like I'm going to do it as everything I can. Like I have kind of like this OCD borderline personality. If I, if I do something, I got to be perfect at it. And so it was really amazing to me to kind of see how everything transferred um, from that aspect of things like, wow, like I, I'm faster, I'm stronger, I'm more athletic, all these things. It was really awesome. And, and for me, you know, as I went to high school, I started doing the more deadlifts, the power cleans and stuff. And I'll kind of get into this a little bit, but um, you know, I was, power cleaning a lot. I was squatting a lot. And I got to the point where I was a sophomore. I believe once I stopped boxing, I stopped doing other sports. And once I was that freshman year, I was about what, buck 60, buck 65, six, three, buck 65. I think six, two, actually, I grew another inch of that next year. But I literally was like, okay, bench squat. And I did like 90 degree bench press for, for overhead athletes, which we'll talk about that in the future. But like floor press and stuff like that. And then the, the power cleans. And then I went from being 165 pounds to 200 pounds in six, three in one year. And I can just all of a sudden became a home run hitter in high school and hitting balls out of the ballpark. And even though I wasn't a home run hitter, I, I had the power to do it. I still considered myself at that time, a line drive guy, but obviously in that age, you're like, dude, I can hit home runs now. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, and then, and we're going to kind of talk about this. And I want to transition this, but like, they, I want to transition to the importance of finding the right street, the conditioning coach, but I was young and I didn't really have, like I had at Kokomo high school, we had a bunch of guys that didn't really know anything about street, the conditioning. So we were taught certain movements and we did them. So you could look like the ugliest dude in the world <laughs> doing yeah. power cleans, like arching your back, doing all this stuff. And so with my mentality, I thought more is better. So my senior year, I'm squatting three times a week. I'm power cleaning three times a week. 
Um, when you're strong and athletic, that is a recipe for disaster. Now, mm -hmm. just I use the analogy like guys that throw hard have a higher higher risk for Tommy John. You put more stress on your arm, more stress on UCL, more stress on your flexors. Guys in the weight room that are stronger, they obviously have a higher risk of getting injured. Nobody's going to get injured, you know, curling and and doing twenty pound curls. And so I was, I was in high school and I was doing power cleans 315 and I was squatting in, in the rack. I was doing it three times a week. And so my lower back was getting really bad. Did a spasm. I got a spasm in my back trying to show off in the weight room like an idiot. And I went and hit um, and BP and I fractured my L4, L, L5, my S1 and my pars bones and, and kind of bulged some disc and really jacked up some discs which long story short, it pretty much set me out for 22 months. And at South Alabama, I had a bunch of issues and stuff. And I stopped lifting weights because I was just trying to get healthy. And now at the time, I thought that not lifting would help. It actually made things dramatically worse. And I should have been lifting the whole time. I just didn't know what to do. And so I did all this rehab and I literally did nothing for me. And I started lifting weights again. And that's when my back started feeling better. And I found out mobility, the importance of like doing kind of yoga stuff to kind of help in my back. Um, so anyways, long story sh short, like once I started lifting again in college too, like my last couple of years of college, like I really started getting back into it. And then my numbers started getting better. And it's not mm -hmm. a coincidence that my numbers were always better when I was in the weight room. And for me guys, like this is where I want to transition to kind of, I told my story a little bit, so, um, you could, you could bear with me for this part, but, um, this part for me is really important. It's the reason why I do what I do. And I know it's the reason why Adam does what he does, but finding the right coach, finding the right mentors to help you develop your children or develop your athletes is so important. And like for me, I was just going balls to the wall. I, I had people helping me, but I had people training me as like a bodybuilder type guy or a football guy. And I hate using that term, but that's kind of essentially what they were doing instead of just training myself to be a better overall mobility, stability, strong, powerful, explosive athlete. And so Adam, can you kind of touch on a little bit how important it is you think um, for guys to find the right type of coach and what that right type of coach looks like? Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is tr trust has to be the number one issue of trust. And you're like, we talked about last episode is you're making an investment here. So be able to look at a track record, see what their method is behind the madness. And are they producing kids to get better? Are they, unfortunately, do they have a track record of injuring kids? If they have an injury track record, then that's, you better run for the hills because you're not looking to get in this. Every coach that has ever came on here is availability is the best ability. And I'm glad, I'm glad that you hit on the part of the, usually the strongest guys in the weight room are unfortunately going to have maybe the hamstring pulls come, the quad pulls, whatever it is, just because they're so powerful and explosive. It's just kind of the part of the nature. But what I wanted to talk about as well was when Lib Bloom came on here and said that maybe early on in his career, he was – Hey, how many, how much weight can I put on my back? And we've all been in that situation when we're young, we're 20, testosterone is going, we want to show off in the rate room where now transitioning is, does that even help? That actually may hurt me in the long run of my knees, my ankles, my shins, whatever it is from that standpoint, as opposed to going to do this other exercise that may help. And it's basically doing the same exact thing instead. So mm -hmm. I think what's very important is finding that coach that you trust, putting a plan together being held accountable to that plan. And then also if you're having an injury pop up, and this is what I kind of want to ask you after we finish this one is, can you explain the difference? Cause I think the biggest thing is everybody, you're going to get sore. And I think when people start to get sore, number one, they're either scared of it and they don't like feeling like that, or they don't know the difference between being sore and being injured. And I think once you kind of evaluate your get over that, I'm going to be soreness all right, that's just part of the nature versus, hey, I do have an injury. But like you said for yourself is you had a back injury, whereas they probably just told you sit and rest. Mm -hmm. And I hate seeing this where guys are being prescribed, hey, rest for four to six weeks. Well, what is that doing for my body? It's not just healing on its own. I mean, it's going to do a little bit of healing, but there's got to be other stuff to speed this up. And with this generation, like you said, it's 2020 now. There's so much you can find to speed up the recovery process or speed up the injury, the rehab coming back from injury. So do your research and find that coach that is number one, really invested, has a great track record that gets after it with you in the weight room. Don't find the coach that's on a cell phone while you're trying to work out and lift weights, find somebody that's in this thing, blood, sweat, and tears with you. And one last thing I'm going to add on this is everybody. If you watch Sean on ESPNU, the announcers raved about his size and his <laughs> physique. I thought it was awesome because they were all over him about how well he looks because he's a strength coach is if I'm going to invest money into a strength program, I just want my strength coach. He doesn't have to look like a Greek God, but he needs to show some accountability where he actually cares for himself. And he's not 
a big fat slob that's trying yep. to tell my kid that he needs to do all this other stuff. Cause that's just not a good look from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of hit Sean to kind of carry over that, whatever you have to pick up there, but also just to kind of explain the difference sore and injury. The, the difference between you kind of broke up on me right there. The yeah, difference between being sore and being injured, being sore, being injured. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I will say this part aspect of things is guys, when they start getting in the weight room in the beginning, and we kind of touched on this earlier, like, you know, if you're weak, you need to get bigger, faster, stronger. And I'll give you some examples of guys in my program. And Adam will give you some examples of, of why it helps and where they are now. Uh, but when it comes to starting, like guys are scared and guys get nervous. And cause I will say, I would say half of the public does not like lifting weights, maybe yeah. more, maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. And it's probably 75%, but Specifically, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, our evaluations with players at the end of summer, strength, stronger, more powerful is always a part of it. And a lot of times, like we actually, I heard this story from a dad um, that basically asked the coach after he gave that evaluation and said, well, is there anything else we can do? And so they're, they're looking for an easier way out. They don't want to do that stuff. Like people don't want to do the hard work. And and I get it too. Like people, like everybody wants to ease you out, but I, I'm going to tell you anything worth in life. And every successful person will tell you this. It's going to be hard. You're going to have trials, tribulations. There's going to be times like, shit, man, I, I don't know if I could do this. And it's just, it's the nature of the beast. And you have to go through adversity and harden yourself up in order to become the person you are, or the person you, excuse me, the person you want to be. Um, so saying that, like, so guys will start training and that, that mentality, that weakness comes in their heads. Like, Oh, I'm sore. And we all have, we all have that inner weak mentality. We all have that, that voice in our head that says, Oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Is this even going to help? Why should I do this? Um, and, and you know, for me, it's, I tell the kids like, just because you're sore doesn't mean you're always going to feel that way. The more you get used to doing something, especially in the weight room, that shock phase, if you are just now starting to lift you start getting sore, like, oh my God, am I always going to feel like this? No, you're not. Your body's going to adapt. Like I'm going to tell you right now, I rarely ever get sore now um, lifting weights. I get sore a little bit sometimes, but I've done it for so long and I do it so consistently that I don't really get sore very often. And I can still go out, run, throw, hit, do stuff as a coach and also as with my kids. Um, but guys, you know, when you are feeling like sharp shooting pain deep in your joints, Versus all my muscles are sore, my muscles are tight. You got to understand the difference between those two things. I always will tell guys, like, if you can still physically do things, like specifically hamstrings, hamstrings are always something that gets super sore with guys. Mm -hmm. You can still run, you can still jump, you're just a little sore. You're not able to do it as explosively as you want to. And guys think, oh, well, I'm sore, I need to do nothing. No, it's just like throwing. Like, and I use the analogy for strength and conditioning. Just because I'm sore doesn't mean I stop lifting. Just because I'm sore from throwing doesn't mean I stop doing my 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 prehab, my band exercises, my throwing light, my flat grounds, all this stuff. Like, your body will adapt to whatever you can put, whatever you put it through. Like the body, like you know, God made these made our bodies to be able to adapt to such harsh environments, and it's not just our bodies, but our our, our mental toughness as well. And there's so many guys that they get that soreness and they want to, they run away from it. But you know, one thing you're going to expect is as the guys that are listening to this is when you do get that soreness, that's your body it has some inflammation. You're growing, like your body is growing. Now you're going to become stronger with that soreness. Like if I do have soreness or if I do feel a little sluggish, I'm like, well, this is good. Cause I'm going to recover. I'm going to get stronger and I'm going to be a better version of myself in the future tomorrow or the next day. Um, and that's one thing is people just don't want to go through the hard work. They don't want to do um, the things that, you know, that, that test them mentally and physically. And that's one thing about the weight room. The analogy I used with Arnold before is, you know, you test yourself mentally, physically, and emotionally in the weight room. You're around a bunch of guys in the weight room and we're squatting or we're doing lunges or we're doing sled and you feel like you're going to pass out. You know, there's certain situations now all the time. We're not trying to make kids puke, but when you push your body to the limits, you're going to, you're going to have to learn to be able to get on the, the other side of that mountain. Um, like everybody wants to be a Mike Trout. And I said this the other day too, everybody wants to be Alabama football, but you've got to put in the work to be those guys. You got to put in the work to have that process. And part of that process is, you know, I'm going to work hard every single day, no matter how I feel that's discipline. Um, but is there anything else you want to add on to that, Adam, about the source? Yeah, sure. yeah. I got a question I want to ask you. So would you recommend, so for that high school college player to lift maybe during the mornings and hit and do the throwing in the afternoon or would you rather hit and throw and do that stuff first and then do the lifting afterwards what would you kind of recommend so that's a really good question so when it comes to the strength and conditioning aspect i always want to, if i can keep them separate i want to keep them separate um if i have to do them back to back as it is busy like we're really busy i would like to do my skill position stuff first like if i'm doing a hitting lesson or a lifting or something like that then i'll do my lifting now you can do one or the other 
the, when it comes to taking care of the arm, so with pitchers specifically, you don't want to be throwing with a fatigued forearm. You don't want your forearm fatigued. So if you say you're doing farmer's walks or you're doing a lot of grip work in the weight room and you turn around and you want to go through a bullpen, that's not a good idea. Um, you know, and it's, it, it can it be done? Yes. Do I have variations for pitchers if they're like, Hey coach, I'm lifting right now. Like I, Nate Dome, one of my kids that played with me in the bulls this year, he's been lifting me for four years, throws low nineties. That kid would lift three days in a row. And then on Thursdays with those shutouts or Fridays with mm -hmm. those shutouts. But part of that is like, I would minimize some of the grip work. I would make sure that he's not doing, um, stuff to where his forearms are going to be too fatigued. Uh, the next day to where it'll, you know, put him a chance for injury or also maybe he gets tired and doesn't have an actual game. Um, but if you're training, the optimally way I would do it is I like doing three times a week strength and conditioning at that age. A lot of people like four, four is fine. But for me, I, I like three better because it allows guys to get more sports specific work done, more speed work done, mobility work done on top of it. Because if you really get after it for an hour, hour and 15 minutes in the weight room, you really only need three times a week. Mm -hmm. Um, like I, I have my best gains in, in my life. My right now as you know, a 34 year old man, um, lifting three times a week. And I, my athletes, uh, Larry's training lift three times a week. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you could go the skill sport first, then the lifting that is optimal. There are some times that you have to do it. Just make sure you understand it as a pitcher, you have to kind of be aware of the arm and the arm care and stuff like that. It doesn't mean you're not training hard because our, our pitchers train harder or just as hard as anybody. Mm -hmm. like I got, I got an all American wrestler, all American football player, a high school football player, and a, you know, an all state baseball player pitcher. They're training in the weight room at the same time. It, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. Like we're, we're going to be able to make adjustments and which gets me into this part. I, I, I want to talk about this, but if somebody tries to sell you, if you're trying to find a street, the conditioning coach, and they're trying to sell you sports specificity in the weight room, they are full of so much BS. It's not even funny. There's no <laughs> such thing as sports specific strength training. Now there is athlete specific strength training, like and it's like prehab type stuff, but strength and conditioning in itself, like this is my theory. And I have a template program that I train all guys with, whether it's a swimmer, whether it's a volleyball player, whether it's a baseball player at the age groups that I'm working with, which is anywhere from 11 to 22, 23 years old are the guys that are in college that come and lift with me, whether it's in the winter or in the summer. Like I just had, I use Friday night guy was lifting with us all summer and lifting with a bunch of 12 year olds at the same time. And we want guys to get mobile. We want guys to have strong cores so they can actually control their trunk, control their body. We want them to be strong as hell. We want them to be explosive. So we're training in the weight room. Like if you want to talk about like, you know, Louis Simmons talks about it. Like we train in a, you know, dynamic effort method, we train in a max effort method. We train in a repetition effort method. So we're training all three aspects to grow muscle, but also to, to become a better athlete and more explosive, powerful, et cetera. Um, do I have certain exercises? Like for wrestlers, I take care of their knees, ankles, necks a lot. Mm -hmm. So I keep their necks strong. Football players, we take care of their necks because I don't want them to have concussions. Uh, basketball players, ankles and knees. Uh, low backs with baseball players and basketball players. Uh, baseball players, we need to keep the shoulder healthy and make sure we have good scapular upward rotation, good scapular mobility. There are certain exercises that I use as fillers. And so I'll tell, hey, you know, Braden, who's, one, who's the, the guy, he's an All-American football player, an All-American um, uh, wrestler as a, as a high school guy. He's a senior this year. We take care of his neck. We take care of his knees. We take care of his ankles a lot of times because those are kind of the trouble spots wrestling a heavyweight. And at the same time, like if we're doing a main lift of the day, our main lift takes about 20 to 25 minutes. They're doing these exercises in between their sets to kind of help them with their sport. But the actual program in itself, we're all squatting. We're all, we're all doing explosive. We're doing deadlifts. We're all doing sled sprints. We're all doing sled drags, farmers walks. We're all doing all the same stuff. There's just certain things that we throw into it to take care of athletes that have different needs. And so the actual cookies, you know, the actual cookies and cream of the, of the program is relatively the same, but if somebody says, "Oh man, we got to work on you know this plane specific movement in baseball," yes, we want to work on the same planes. But you know your sports. If you want to get better at throwing a baseball, you need to throw a baseball. If you want to get better at hitting a baseball, you need to hit a baseball. Those things in the weight room help you become the help the metrics of doing those things. But just like you, Adam, you pointed out a while ago, you could throw any power lift in the world. He's probably going to hit it 105 mile an hour off the off the tee, off the bat, but. That's, I kind of wanted to get on that tangent right there because that's something that is sold to kids and sold to parents all the time. And when you're looking for a strength coach, like you mentioned before, like if I, if I want to find somebody that, that is going to help my son, I want to find somebody that looks the part, 
has the experience, has the education too, because I want to make sure he's not just a meathead. It's like, hey, let's just do more weight um, or, or do more reps. We want to make sure the guy is helping my son mentally, helping my son physically, get more explosive. But at the same time, I want him to make sure that he's healthy. Like you said, like my first priority as a strength coach is keeping my kids healthy. Boom. Mm -hmm. First, the player development and the physical tools and the improvements that those, those come second. Cause I got to make sure that he's able to perform on the mat or perform on the field. Um, and that's a lot of things that are way overlooked. Cause there's guys that, you know, I, I was just talking to our executive director of the bulls the other day and he mentioned like, Oh, this guy, you know, yada, yada, yada. And I go, huh? Like there's certain people that look on the outside, you know, outside looking in, you can look at people and think they have it together. But if I got a guy that looks like he's got a pot belly and, you know, drinking beer all the time and he's trying to tell us what to do, like there's a, there's a specific coach at a school around here, a college, a college around here that I'm not going to mention. He's 140 pounds soaking wet. He's a pitching coach. Mm -hmm. He's on Twitter talking about how to gain weight, and how to gain muscle. I'm like, dude, shut up, man. You don't know how to gain weight and gain muscle. <laughs> like, Get out of here, man. Like it, I'm I would never talk about and pretend to be something I'm not, but people yeah. do it all the time. So do your research as a parent, do your research as a, as a coach, um, as a dad and as a mother and make sure you're finding the right person, you know, make sure the person looks apart, make sure the person has the education and listen to other people. Cause you know, the best, the best, the best thing I could say is if you, his clients, that person's clients, they're going to be able to tell you the truth about what this guy's like. But for sure. And I think it was a good thing too, is I think, especially with both of us is we're going to try to have all the answers, but if we do not have it, we're going to find the answers for you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do our research. We're going to back it up, but I promise you if something comes up and we don't know the thing, I'm going to text Sean and say, Hey buddy, I've got a guy that's struggling with this. What do we need to do? Yep. Or does he need to ice? Does he need to do this? What do we need to do to kind of get him back ready to go and try mm -hmm. to find that answer for you? And that all goes back with just having that relationship of caring about your athletes and caring how they're performing and how they're doing out there on, on the field, because ultimately the game is played on the field. So yep. The game isn't just won by getting big, fast, strong, which is very important. But now you got to translate that over to the field. Going back to – you can have a power lifter that goes out there and hits the ball really hard, but he doesn't have the hand-eye coordination to put it together during a, a live game situation. So that's a big part of it too. Yep. Adam, yep. you got any examples of guys that have kind of gone through your fitness program and your training program at, at High or Heat and kind of situations? I know you use yourself as an example, which I think is a phenomenal example because it gives guys that – are behind the eight ball a little bit like, Hey, you know, once I get a little older, things are going to kind of kind of mature and things are going to work out, but kind of breaks down a little bit from your, your aspect of things on the high heat side. Yeah. So kind of even bracing it back to me is I personally look back now and I think baseball, we're kind of a soft sport. And I was one of the soft guys that I didn't like getting sore. That's why I didn't like working out when I was 15 mm -hmm. or 16 years old because I didn't like feeling like that. Whereas now you're seeing you have to have that stuff if you want to play at the high levels. Just in our locker room alone at South Alabama, we may have had one guy in particular, and you probably know what I'm talking about, that wasn't necessarily <laughs> a weight room guy, but he performed on the field. And yep. it just worked for him. And it was just kind of like, hey, you do you, man, because you come up, you're ready to play every day, and you perform and you get after it. And you're naturally – gifted genetically that's just congratulations to you but that's one out of 35 and so mm -hmm. I think a lot of kids want to think in their own head that ah, I don't have to do the extra stuff like I, I'm pretty talented already or I'm athletic this I can get away with not lifting because you will get exposed to each level that you continue to go up and one of the cool things uh here with the heat that we did with I would say is we're going on year two or he's a junior in college now so there was two college or they just finished up their high school season uh it was when we first opened because we opened three years ago they came in wanting to enhance their swing as well as get in on a strength and conditioning program because they came in and said I asked basically the first day hey what are you doing now it was the basic high school stuff of squat bitch clean uh, they go to the local gym they do bicep curls tricep work out like a bodybuilder and so automatically it was we're changing that because you need better movements because baseball is all about moving you're getting stiff you're looking like a bodybuilder that's not going to play at that next level so we have to we want to pack on the mass but it needs to be explosive and it needs to be how fast can I move this type of weight and so we instantly changed out their kind of bodybuilding form to deadlifts to box dumps to lunges to sled pushes to sprints to uh jump sprint side sprints laying down sprint whatever it is just to kind of get them ready get that body ready for what they're about to go through at that college level and both of them went on they went to junior college first were successful now one with the d1 one's at a, a nai here in town and they both have a lot of success and they're looking the baseball part now because they'll look back at their pictures and be like, man, we didn't know what the heck we were doing <laughs> like before we came there because they had never been taught 
and their high school program didn't give them that information. Uh, is it their fault? No, it's not. It's just kind of the situation they were in. But even that was kids that had already graduated high school going to that college level looking for more. And so with that starting, it kind of passed the generation down to where now we're having 12 and 13 year olds get in here and start to learn how to move. Uh, even with our program we had with the Florida Baseball Ranch, it was a throwing program, but they worked out every day. It wasn't just you throw all the time. And I yep. think that was a big thing that they were trying to understand was – you're going to do these certain movements. You have a power day, you have a speed day, you have a strength day. Everything's going to be planned for you and organized for you. Now you've got to show up and do the work. It's not just you come in here long toss, expect your arm to continue to get stronger. And we saw that not only did their strength improve, their athletic ability improve, they're running faster, they're hitting harder. And did we necessarily focus on that stuff? No, it just was kind of putting their body into the position of moving fast, being in control of their body, moving the right way. And that was a big part that kind of helped them realize like there's more to the picture here than just being good on the baseball field, like how these two go together. And I think that all goes back to the correlation. And I'll say all the time is like you can't be soft in this game of baseball. Mm -hmm. And for a while we were soft. Our pitchers, all they would do is run poles. They would throw and run poles. That was the whole thing. Now, I know we've mentioned on the podcast before is you have your pitcher sprinting the day after they pitch, the next day, whatever it is. Like, you're going to have a totally opposite of, hey, go run for 20 minutes, get the lactic acid out, and there's that. Well, that running is nothing like you're going to perform from a pitching standpoint of being explosive movements. And it's just kind of just like anything in life. Things are starting to change. The more the information is out there, the better this stuff is getting. And the last example I use, and it's not from here, is I was reading the other day about Alabama football. We brought them up before. This year they got a new strength coach that came from IU, actually. They got their strength staff that came down here now, and their players are raving about how much better they're feeling. And they're not – they're on the field. One thing that I think Saban has talked about the last two or three years with Cochran, the guy that jumped up and down and yelled a lot, was he successful? Yes, but towards the end of the career, there's a lot more ankle injuries, foot injuries, these lower body injuries that were just starting to happen. And so Saban – on his part, went out and said, I'm going to find the kind of next generation of guys, brought those guys in, and they are having great reviews about how they're correlating all to this to get them on the field and help them be their best player on the field. And that's ultimately what it's going to come down to, and that's what our, our, our goals are as a strength coach or as a baseball coach in general. And going back to it, we filled out our evaluations for the Knights players, and literally every one but maybe one or two was strength. It's, yeah. That's just the nature of the game. It's going to be – you've got to get stronger. You've got to get faster. You've got to throw harder. You've got to move better. You've got to swing faster. Like, there's just so much that goes into it, and it all starts going back to the correlation of strength and explosiveness right there. Yeah, and people don't want to hear that stuff. They don't want to hear that they need to get stronger, and it's something that parents fight it. Not all parents, obviously. I wouldn't have a job if parents fought it. <laughs> um, but I, you, you really hit the nail on the head earlier, too. Like, a lot of high schools, they just do squat, bitch, clean, squat, bitch, clean. And I always will say to my clients, like – I wouldn't have a job if all high schools gave the kids everything they needed to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing against those coaches. Like I, I, there's a coach here in town, football coach here in town who I'm, I'm friends with. I think he's a really great guy. Um, and I train a lot of their guys. And um, I, what I want to do, and I'm doing my strength and conditioning is I want to, you know, be supplemental to what they do. I want to help them what they do. I want to make sure I'm doing the things that they're not able to do. Cause most classes, you probably have 30 to 35 minutes to lift in high school mm -hmm. in those classes. Some of the guys on block schedule might have almost, you know, 45 minutes to, to, to 55 minutes. Uh, but there's so many things that are missed. Like guys aren't warming up, you know, guys aren't working on the little muscles to take care of the big muscles. Um, you know, there's so many things that, that, people overlook because it's like okay what like as football coaches or guys i say football coaches because most of the time those are the guys running the high school weight rooms it's like i need to develop guys i only have 40 minutes let's develop these guys so they they kind of neglect the mobility stuff uh, like you're talking about ankles knees hips you know shoulders back uh, and then they neglect a lot of the unilateral work um you know the speed work it's all about let's get stronger 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 um, but you have to have, it's, it's a, it's a balance scale. You got to have a little bit of both. You got to have, you know, a maximum, you know, you got to increase muscle mass, but at the same time, stay limber. The right programs help guys do all of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's one thing, like people always ask, well, Hey, do I really need to do this if I'm doing classes? Oh, well, hell yeah, absolutely. It, it helps you in a lot of things. That's the thing is like, if a guy's coming to me and say, Hey coach, I squatted, you know, you know, five sets of six today and I'm dead. We're not going to do a squat if I have that on the program. We're going to do something different. We can we do alternative or, you know, 
regression or progression exercises all the time for athletes. And that's something, again, as a strength coach, like we talked about before, there is a template to train guys, but we do have things that we substitute and change for certain guys based on what their needs are. Um, and that's not sports specific, just FYI. <laughs> um, and Sean, let me uh, go ahead and tee you up, Q, because I want you to kind of harp on the nutrition side of this, because we've done so much talk about the strength in the weight room side, but can you kind of elaborate on how important it is to feed the engine? And one uh, analogy I like to use is, if you got that Lamborghini, you're not putting regular unleaded gas into that bad boy. Yep. You've got to yep. feed it the right stuff. And with you having a nutrition license, can you kind of elaborate and talk about you're going to prescribe them with this information of what to eat, how much to eat, weigh your stuff, but you can't physically track everybody down and make them do this and how they have to hold themselves accountable when they commit to this. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm precision nutrition certified. Um, you know, uh, John Berardi is a guy that kind of started that stuff. Um, and I actually, in, in college, I, I had exercise science and sports nutrition courses a lot. And especially when I was getting my master's. And so I wanted to make sure that when I was doing this, not only am I helping the kids physically, mentally, but I also want to make sure they're putting the right things in their bodies to make sure I, I find the foundation of that. Cause I really was like, Hey, let's eat more, you know, eat big to get big, which is important. And you need to do that. So that's a hundred percent of fact, but we also want to make sure we're putting the right fuel in our bodies. Like you said, like we got to treat our body like a Lamborghini. We got to put that premium gas in there, man. We got to let it roll. Um, so I always will start with kids and they, every single skin kid, and I'll tell this right now, every single skinny kid says, Oh, I eat so much food. Mm -hmm. I eat, uh, I've never met a skinny kid that says that that's actually eating enough. Like it doesn't happen. Um, and so I'll start with this is you look at what you eat. Most of the time kids eat very light at breakfast. If at all, they have a decent lunch and then they have a huge giant dinner. So that's probably about 2,500 to 3000 calories. If you're trying to make gains, you need to be anywhere between that 4,000 to 6,000 calorie range. And you're like, what? 6,000 calories. Some guys need that. Some guys only need 4,000. Like I, myself, I probably consume 4,500 to 5,000 calories a day to just maintain what I have. Um, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. And I try to fluctuate and be there, but I'm just going to break down some rules for you guys that are listening. Like, Hey, what do I need to do? How do I need to eat? So my first rule when I got guys in the weight room, when it comes to orientation is I say, Hey, we're shooting for five to six meals a day. And we're always trying to eat five to six meals a day. So if you got to prepare some snacks in your backpack before you go to school the night before you're doing that. And so what I always say is like, I really, I'm a really big fan. If the, your three biggest foods for building muscle is steak, whole milk, right? and eggs. Those three, those three foods, if you're consistently eating those in your diet, you're going to gain muscle and you're going to have a lot of protein. And people think it's just protein, protein, protein. That's not true. We need to have good fats and we need to have good solid carbohydrates, especially when it comes to athletes. So the first meal of the day, I always tell people like, you know, if you can eat some lean protein or eat some mixed nuts, eat some eggs for breakfast every morning, that's good. Don't be sitting there eating cereal and stupid stuff like that. That's just, it's a waste of your time. Um, so let's just say a guy eats eggs and has a protein shake in the morning for breakfast. Boom. Got a great meal the first day. You got your 16 ounces of whole milk. Maybe you threw in some protein powder in there. You know, you're good to go. So that kid, same kid, he prepped and goes, Hey, I need to make sure I have another meal. So I have a plan and two of the meals a day are basically this big list of snacks. And I say, you have to choose two to three of these on here. Some of it's fruit, some of it's mixed nuts. Maybe it's just cashews or just, uh, pistachios. Um, maybe it's a, 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 a protein shake. They put some protein powder or, um, a meal replacement powder inside there. They can consume as well. Um, like I said before, apples and bananas and stuff like that stuff to fuel their body. So that's going to be their 10 AM. So they say eat breakfast at 7 AM, their 10 AM mark. They're going to eat something like that lunchtime. And I always tell people like, and this is for every, every meal you want to try to consume whole foods. Like if it's, if you can pick it from the earth or, or you can kill it, that's what you want to eat. Um, and so like, don't eat fries. Like it's okay to have fries and stuff like that every now and then, but the potato chips, but that's, it has to be on rarities. But the problem is, is today's age and athletes that are running around and families that are running around and don't eat dinner all the time together. They're eating potato chips, ding dongs, Twinkies and, and crap like that. <laughs> yeah. And we don't want to fuel our body with that. Now I'll get into that in a minute about certain times to have simple sugars, but, um, and so for lunch, I say, hey, get two chicken sandwiches for lunch. Don't get chicken sandwich. Don't get a chicken sandwich and fries. Right. Get a grilled chicken sandwich and get a, a hamburger. Boom. You know what I mean? You're getting some carbs. You're getting some protein. You're getting some fats. And you're drinking your whole milk with it or regular milk or whatever. Like I was lactose intolerant, so I never drank milk. Um, but I would drink a lot of water and stuff like that. And then you got your second meal, which is your two snacks that we talked about before. You know, those options, peanut butter sandwiches, peanut butter jelly sandwiches, peanut butter honey. There's so many things that you can add in little sandwiches and pack those. 
So that would be one, two, three, yeah, four. So that's four meals. Boom. Just like that. And then you got your dinner, which this is where you need to consume a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of protein, and you can consume some fats as well right here. And so guys that train with me, we talk about peri-workout nutrition, like your pre-workout, your during, and your post. So guys that are hard gainers, the skinny guys, I will always tell them like, hey, what you need to do before you come in is I want you to make sure you eat 60 to 90 minutes before you come in. Um, I tell them you can use protein shakes if you like. The college guys, I do a protein shake before and after. Um, but the young guys, we tell them like, get some fruit, you know, get some, get some, get some quality foods inside you about 60 to 90 minutes before you lift. And if it's a couple hours before you lift, no big deal. It's just the nature of the beast. But during your workout, you're going to consume a Gatorade. So they're going to get some simple sugars during the workout to kind of help fuel them, keep them hydrated and stuff like that. Um, sometimes we use it for post-workout. Again, this is, I, I'm throwing a bunch of stuff at people listening right now. So it's a bunch of different things. But most importantly, when you get done lifting, you broke down muscle tissue. So you need to make sure that you're getting some food in you immediately after. Now, if you're eating dinner right after, and I'll stress this right now, like you don't need protein shakes. Like you don't need supplements. Um, and we could talk about supplements another day and creatine and stuff like that because those are things that I always have guys look into and we talk about. I don't ever make anybody do anything, but I always say like you have to eat real whole foods. You don't want to be so a lot of people say shakes are for fakes. So if you're getting your, if you're getting your, all of your protein from protein shakes, you know, you're, you're setting yourself behind the bar. You're not going to, it's not going to work out. You need to be eating steak. You need to be eating chicken. You need to be eating fish. You know, lean meats is what you want. I'm a big, big advocate of lean red meat, especially with all the new studies right now. People, they used to think of that as a devil, but obviously new studies right now are showing people are a lot healthier doing that, especially with the, the how the popular, the, the carnivore diet right now. But so post-workout, sorry to get back at that again. So I like doing a post-workout insulin spike. So if guys want to consume a 32-ounce Gatorade with all those sugars and maybe they have their creatine with it, they pound that and then they have their two scoops of protein with it. So they're getting their 75 grams of carbs. They're getting their 40 to 50 grams of protein immediately post-workout. So, you know, that insulin spike is going to send that creatine to the muscle cells. It's going to help that protein, you know, get into the system, um, you know, basically get you recovered, the glutamine that's in the protein, all those things. And then after that, they'll eat dinner. And then the guys that are heart gainers, again, they will have a nighttime shake. And sometimes this is just whole milk, peanut butter, oats, yams, like stuff like that. We're putting real food in a blender. You don't need to waste money on a mass gainer. You don't even need protein powder if you, if you mix it right. Put bananas, put fruit in there. Now, some guys use protein powder just for the flavor. But that's kind of like how I run through and teach guys a little bit of nutrition. Obviously, it's a little bit more detailed than that. Um, but you're looking at five to six meals a day. Now... The goal with us, if guys lift with me, we're thinking about increasing a good one pound of lean mass a week. Um, I've had, we had a Purdue pitcher come in a couple winters ago and he had six weeks because coach, I need to gain 10 pounds. All right, dude, let's do it. You got to follow me to a T. So he, he ended up gaining 10, almost 10, 11 pounds and did a bod pod test at Purdue university and nine to 10 of that 11 pounds was muscle. So he, right. he only gained one pound of fat and he was following the stuff that I literally just outlined. And so there's probably people like, I don't want to eat that much. I, it, I just, I have a hard time. I just don't need to do it. This is what you do. You set an alarm on your phone for every two and a half hours or three hours, whether you're hungry or not, you're eating mm -hmm. period, like it, period, like you have to eat. And if you write down a list of things that you can have as options for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, and you just stick to that list, good things are going to happen. But again, like if you want to gain mass and you're not lifting weights, and you're eating all that food, it's going to be fat you're gaining. So obviously, like guys are like, oh, maybe I can get this mass without doing all the hard work in the weight room. Well, yeah, you're going to get a lot of fat if you're getting, you know, gaining muscle, losing, or sorry, gaining weight, like quality weight, lean mass versus, you know, losing fat. Like it's all calories in versus calories out. We routinely put on 20 to 25 to 30 pounds of lean mass on guys in the off seasons yeah. um, over the course of one calendar year. Like I got a kid who's in Louisville. He's a pitcher, Jack Perkins. Uh, this is like three or four years ago. Um, he was already a, a physical guy. Like he was athletic, strong, powerful, but he needed another 25, 30 pounds. And he put on 25, 30 pounds in one off season. There's so many examples I can use for guys like that. And it's not just for Larry Shane. There's a lot of people that do what I do and do what Adam does. They can give the same type of examples. We're not, it's, we don't have any secret formulas. It's just teaching the right things, doing the right things. And those kids have to have the discipline to do it day in and day out. But that's the kind of the, the nutrition part that I wanted to kind of touch on too. And I'm glad you asked that question, Adam. Is there anything else you want to jump in and add on to that part? 
No, I think you nailed everything right there. I think it's just people look past. So now they're getting into they lift the weight. So that's the next step. But well, now there's another step. It's the nutrition, also the hydration, also the yep. sleeping. And that's another thing that just gets overlooked. And that's why we talk about all the time is this game – will separate those ones that want it versus the ones that don't. As simple as setting your phone to remind you to eat. It's, it sounds simple, but people don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. People don't want to sleep the 8 to 10 hours a night. They want to stay on their phones and text. People don't want to drink waters. I have guys come here all the time that go, I just don't like water. Well, sorry, you're going to drink it. You're going to have to drink it. you got to stay hydrated for your muscles. Going back to that's what's going to help you be on the field. Uh, one big thing I wish that we could kind of get out to all of us, all the guys, is we both are in the travel ball world, is – don't show up that before the game eating uh, whatever for McDonald's for breakfast yeah. <laughs> right in the dugout before you're about to play a game. Like that stuff matters. It's, it's such a big part of this. And it, I sucked at it. I wish there was something I wish I would have done whenever I was playing to kind of help fuel myself and realize how important that was and actually dive into it and do research on it because I think it would help us healthier on the field better performance, higher energy, and not having to always resort to, hey, I need to take this pre-workout to get ready to do this workout or to play this game. And it was kind of already in there. And so it, it all just goes back, are you willing to do the extra stuff? Yep. If, you're, if you're not, it's going to weed you out just like it always does for everybody else. But if you're serious about this stuff, you can either do research on your own, you can ask myself, you can ask Sean. Like there's ways to find out more information. Now, once you find out that information, it's up to you to actually do it. Absolutely, man. And that's to me, it, it's it's about discipline. It's about accountability. It's about doing the things you don't want to do. Adam hit the nail on the head there. It's like, you know, it's simple, but simple is not easy. It's never, it never is. Like, and Kobe Bryant, who just passed away, he was a guy that motivated me a lot. And he would always talk about the reason why he is so good is he does the basic stuff better than anybody. And I remember hearing Jay Williams said that about him. I was like, oh man, that's such a good quote. That's, that's, I love hearing that. And, you know, that guy just, you know, that guy impacted billions of people in the world. And that was his mentality toward things. I'm going to do the basic things better than anybody. And, you know, eating, nutrition, training, all that stuff is basic. It's simple, um, but it's not simple at the same time. Exactly. Um, But absolutely. Well, this is a great episode. I'm really, I'm really excited for guys to be able to listen to this. Is there anything else you want to add on before we head out? No, we're all good to go. Keep swinging on 3-0 and keep hitting dingers, boys. That's right. 3-0 <laughs> bombs. Let's roll. All right, guys. Uh, make sure if you guys uh, like this episode, give us that five-star review. And until next time, guys, we'll see you later.